associate pastor for those that, who may not know who I am. And I've got a quick little announcement. We've noticed throughout the last few weeks that we've been seeing some new faces. And with that, we want to connect with you. So maybe this is your first time, maybe it's your second time, and we want to connect with you. So in front of you, in every blue chair is a connection card. If you would just please fill this out, fill out the connection card. Maybe you've got some questions for us, and uh, we want to be able to reach you. Also, for existing members, maybe you've moved in the past year or so, and you've changed address. This is a good way for you to put down that you've changed addresses so that we can uh, make that, so we can, we can better connect to the church. Amen? So with that, we'll get started. Morning. Morning. Grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each of you. It's great to have you in here. It's dark and cold and rainy out there, but the light of Christ is in here. And it's, a, it's an honor to be able to celebrate that with you today. So welcome to church. Uh, we have, we'll have a couple of announcements at the end, but let's just, uh, this morning, let's just get right to it. Let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, we've gathered together in your presence to offer our praise and our prayers. And we come before you, God, with confidence, knowing that, that even when we can't find the words, your own spirit is right there with us, praying in us and praying for us, giving shape to our wordless hopes and longings and pleading for us before the throne of grace. So, Lord, we come with joy to offer you our worship, to offer worship to you who know us and love us better than we could know and love ourselves. We pray all this in Jesus' name, who is the author and perfecter of our, our faith, and the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to Jesus. For those of you coming to church online, welcome to church. Welcome to Jesus. And as we come into worship this morning, I just wanted to uh, just kind of tell you about uh, this first song that we're going to do. Uh, we've done it together before, but uh, in order to do this song, we, I think we have to start with uh, John chapter 16. Because what's happening in John chapter 16 is... Uh, Jesus is telling his, his followers, his disciples, that he is going to be going away. And he's telling them to, uh, a, 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 to not be concerned. They're, they're concerned about what that means. Is, he, is Jesus talking in a parable? Is he talking literally? You know, uh, what's, what's going on? And, and Jesus says, you know, I, you don't need to be concerned. Uh, you don't need to be concerned that I'm going away. What you need to concern yourself with is what I'm leaving with you. And he says, what I'm leaving with you is two things. I'm leaving a helper, and I'm leaving a promise. And at the end of John chapter 16, it says, don't worry about the world. Don't be concerned about the world. I have overcome the world. And so we have to enter worship this morning, folks. I think that God's leading it on my heart for us to enter worship this morning with that promise. That God says that I have overcome the world, so let's get to work. Shake the dust off. Shake the dust off and let's get to work. Stand your feet and let's worship. The king can lose his bounds. He's never caught off guard. His throne will not. We've never been forgotten. 
I said I was going to do some announcements uh, toward the end, but there's, there's one announcement that, that kind of comes around every time, every year about this time, and that is our annual generosity campaign. Seems kind of mundane. You know, every church does it. You know, every pastor, just like I did, writes a letter, you know, some pithy letter to their, everybody in the parish and sends with it a little, little estimate of giving card. Kind of like getting a bill in the mail probably, Right? So you get this card, and you know the drill. Anybody's been around church very long, you, you bring that thing in, and that's how we fix our budget for the next year based upon the money we have coming in. Seems very mundane, right? But here's the thing. Jesus had a way of taking the most mundane things and infusing them with, with love and grace. Taking the most mundane things and turning them into something sacred. Jesus took bread, and he said, it's just bread. Everybody eats bread. But this bread, I'm going to make the bread of life. Jesus took water, the woman at the well, and said, she's just trying to get water out of a well. Jesus says, 
That's living water. I'll make that living water. That's what Jesus does. He takes common, mundane things, things like an estimate of giving card. And if we'll let him, he'll make that thing into something sacred. He'll take your little bit, and he'll breathe his life into it, and it'll become a lot. Not because of anything you did. Well, there's one thing you have to do. You just have to say yes. You just got to respond. But God will take that mundane little card, and he'll turn it into something sacred. And that little piece of paper with your commitment on it will become life for somebody else in some small way or maybe in some big way. So, yeah, we can look at this, you know, the estimate of giving card and the gyrations we go through every year. We can look at it. It's kind of mundane. It is very pragmatic and important. But we can give that to God. and He'll do the same thing he did with the water for the woman at the well. The same thing he does with a common loaf of bread. He'll make it something sacred. So when we give of ourselves, as little as we are, as imperfect as we are, he takes us and he makes us sacred. And he, makes, he infuses his perfection into us and we become greater than, than what we otherwise would have been. So next week, bring that mundane little piece of paper with you. Write something on it first, hopefully. But bring that with you. And let God take that mundane piece of paper turn it into something sacred and life-giving for somebody else. So, kids, come on up and we give our, uh, our offering to, to help support Miss Jacqueline. And then you can head on back to Miss Jordan's back there somewhere, I'm sure. There they are. Right there by the door and Miss Amanda. And there have the rest of the army. Your power 
condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together we are Christ, we are together with Christ, we are his heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, welcome to, to week two of our holy heart, holy life series. Now, I said, I think it was way back in September, I said, you know, um, up, and, up through, really, Advent, I was really going to be intentional about making sure whatever we do and whatever I, I write a sermon on and preach about, I'm going to really try to do it from a really Wesleyan context, from the, from the context of our Wesleyan heritage, because after all, we are a Methodist church, and that's kind of where our heritage comes from. So I've really been trying to do that. So this Holy Heart, Holy Life um, worship series, it's really all about this Wesleyan concept of, of the process of sanctification. Now, the sanctification is not just a Wesleyan thing, but it's, it's based on the process of sanctification. Or as Wesley would call it in his own words, he would say this, this notion of going on to perfection, going on to perfection. Now, I'm going to tell you right up front, that that phrase, going on to perfection, you're not going to find it in your Bible, that, that phrase in and of itself. But that doesn't mean that it's not biblical through and through. And I think we showed that last week because Jesus' be perfect edict, it was stated very matter-of-factly in his Sermon on the Mount. Remember, we talked about that last week. It came right at the tail end of Matthew chapter 5. It's that, it's that section of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount that starts with, love your enemies, and ends with, be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, obviously, that's a, that's a pretty tall order. So, we've got to ask ourselves, what did Jesus mean by be perfect? What's the, what's the definition of the perfection that we're called to? Well, actually, as I've, as I've thought and prayed about this, um, I think Jesus' definition of of perfection, I think it's really pretty straightforward. I mean, it's not rocket science. Just think of it in terms of this. This kind of helped me. Think of it in terms of what Paul says in, in Romans chapter 5. He says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For me, at least in my mind, that's the standard of the perfect love that we're called to. That's the standard of perfection. What that means is that even though I'm the poster child of imperfection, God loved me so much that he sent his son to die on the cross to save me from my sinful imperfections. Therefore, having, having received God's, God's perfect love, I'm now called to love others in the same way to love others perfectly just as I've been loved perfectly. And that, I think, is what Jesus meant when he said, 
that we're to be perfect, even as our Father in heaven is perfect. So, obviously, while understanding it may be easy, actually doing it is really, really hard. It's really hard. Loving the unlovable, that's hard. Forgiving the unforgivable, that's really hard. Countering hate with love, that's hard. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And if everybody was doing it, this world would be a whole lot different, right? That's hard. Countering those who curse you with blessings rather than, you know, counter curses. You know, it just seems like that's way above the pay grade of us imperfect mortal humans. So how do we get from this imperfect reality that we're living in to this perfect destination that we're called to? How do we get from here to there? Well, obviously, and we, our, our own experience testifies to this, it's a process. It's a journey. It's a long journey. And as we think about this journey, I think here's where Wesley's theology of, theology of grace really comes in, and I think it's helpful as a way of understanding. Now, before we get into the actual Wesleyan theology of grace, I want to do a little level setting. You know, that, that word theology gets kicked around a lot, especially at church. You know, it's kind of a churchy word. So what does that word theology actually mean? What's the definition of that word? Well, the word theology simply means the study of the nature of God, the study of the nature of God. And why do we study something? Why do we study anything? Why do we study biology? Why do we study automotive repair? Why do we study theology? Why do we study finances? Why do we study things? Well, we study them so that we can understand them, duh. But why do we want to understand them? Well, we want to understand these things, biology, theology, automotive maintenance, finance, whatever it is. We want to understand those things so that we can then apply them to our lives, so that they can inform our lives. So Wesley's theology of grace is simply a way for us to understand and therefore apply God's grace. Now, it's not, it's not the only theology of grace. It's not the only way, but it's a pretty good way, and it's the way that comes from our heritage. So with that in mind, Wesley says that no matter where we are, along the journey of our faith, no matter what point we're at along the journey of our faith, it was God's grace that got us there, and it's God's grace that will lead us on, that will move us ahead. No matter where we are on this continuum or journey of our faith, it's God's grace that got us to this point, and it's God's grace, only by God's grace, that we'll move beyond this point. So in terms of what we're talking about here, by God's grace, we're led to turn from our imperfect self-love and turn to God's perfect love. And then, by that same grace of God, we'll be led to actually become that perfect love. God's grace is the fuel that gets us there. But here's the thing that we have to keep in mind. You and I aren't called to just be passengers on this journey. Sitting at Greyhound bus we're talking about. We're not called to be just passengers. We have to actually participate in the process. We actually have to actually respond to God's grace by applying it to our day in and day out, everyday lives. In fact, in an effort to, to, to make that part of it understandable for us, old John Wesley, he was, he was kind of known as the, uh, the practical theologian. You know, he could take these these big concepts, and just make them practical and usable. So he had, a, he had a way for us to understand what this participation thing and where it fits in. He actually came up with, and only Wesley could do this, kind of a, a going on to perfection sort of equation. Believe that? Leave it to old John Wesley to, to put math and theology. You know, I went to seminary largely because they guaranteed me there would be no math involved. And here's old John Wesley put math. So here's this, here's this equation. It's going on to perfection equation. You ready? God's grace plus our response, our participation, equals growing in perfection. 
God's grace plus our response, our participation equals growing in perfection. Now, growing in perfection, if we, if we think about it, growing in perfection is really our, the number one goal of being a Christian, a disciple of Christ, isn't it? Isn't our number one job that of growing day by day into this ever more perfect reflection of God's love? You know, if, if we do that, a lot of other things on our disciple job description kind of take care of themselves. So with all that in mind, let me, let me ask you this. Do you honestly feel like you're growing to perfection? Do you actually feel like you are moving toward that perfection that we're called to? Do you actually feel right now like you're closer in your relationship with God than, than you were yesterday? And here's a kicker. Do you feel like you're loving your neighbor more perfectly today than you did yesterday, than you did last week, than you did last year? Let those questions marinate for a second. And as you do, let me just say that when I assess, honestly assess my own journey on this road to perfection, I gotta be honest, I get kind of depressed at times. I get kind of depressed because while I, while I see seasons and while I see, you know, from this mile marker to this mile marker, you know, growth and feel good about that, it just seems like it's more so overshadowed by these clouds of stagnation at times. And sometimes it even feels like I, I, I backed up and went the wrong way. It, I don't mean to... to air my complaints, but I mean, I'm just being honest. If going on to, if this going on to perfection thing really is a journey, I got to be honest and say oftentimes I feel like I've, I've broken down on the, on the shoulder of the going on to perfection highway, and I'm stuck. You ever get that feeling? So let me ask you, if you, like me, sometimes feel like you're stranded on the shoulder of the going on to perfection highway... What would you attribute what would you attribute your breakdown to? What what would be the cause of that? Is it is it a shortage of God's grace? Or could it be a shortage of your response to God's grace? Remember, we're we're not called to be passengers. We're called to be participants. God's grace plus our response that equals growing in perfection. Well, assuming that, that our stalled on the, on the shoulder of the road thing is, has more to do with our response than, than God's grace, then the question becomes, what do, we, what do we do about it? Or better yet, how do we even know we're on the right road to start with? And assuming we are on the right road, how do we stay on it? And how do we keep moving forward instead of stalling out on the, on the shoulder? Well, again, let's go back to the founder of our Wesleyan faith, old John Wesley. He had something to say about this. And it, it really is, uh, I love this part because it, it really shows his growth and his going on to perfection growth. Well, Wesley, way back when, he was adamant that we grow in our faith out of this sense of assurance. He was adamant that we grow in our faith out of a sense of assurance. And by assurance, he meant this, this kind of unwavering confidence that, that, one, we have been saved by grace through faith, and two, God's perfect grace will lead us on to perfection. Now, Wesley's favorite text with this regard was, of course, Romans 18, or Romans 8, 16, and it's part of the text that and Ms. Lauren read to us. And Romans 8, 16 says, God's spirit joins our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Now, in Wesley's early days, like I said, this was a, this was a growth thing for him. In Wesley's early days, he was uber dogmatic about this concept of assurance. He thought that, that you could not just know that you were 
you were actually, that you actually experienced God's, the assurance of God's saving grace. But he, not just know it, but you could actually experience it. You could have 100% confidence based on an experience that was palpable. And in his early days, he even thought that, that without that assurance, it was so real and experiential, without that assurance, there could be no salvation, let alone perfection. Like I said, he was very dogmatic about it. But thankfully, Wesley grew, and Wesley learned through wisdom and experience what I think you and I already kind of experience, right? Although we can testify to a salvation experience, we're still at times plagued by doubts and questions, aren't we? We're still at times plagued by doubts and questions. Not so much doubts and questions regarding our our salvation per se, but, but doubts as to how our eternal salvation is really evident in our here and, here and now lives, our day-to-day lives. We're saved for eternity, thankfully, but how, does that, how is that evidenced by the way that we're living right now? That's, that's what we sometimes, I think, have doubts and questions about. Or put differently, maybe... Maybe we're assured that we're saved by faith, but we're not so assured that we're, that we're actually growing in our faith, that we're actually going on to perfection. Well, to address this going on to perfection issue, Wesley, in his, in his later years, he, he began to press this notion that Christianity, at its very core, is all about relationships. Christianity at its very core is all about relationship. Our growth, our growth toward perfection, our growth takes place in the context of a very secure and a very loving relationship. And now, I think that, I think that everyone who's married or everyone, certainly parents or anybody who's, anybody who's been a parent or anybody who's had a parent, I think you, you might, we might kind of know this instinctively. We, kinda, we might know it without actually knowing it. So let's use that that parent-child relationship as an example. Now, granted, a parent is just an imperfect human being who just happens to have a kid, right? Right? And so, therefore, no parent is perfect 100% of the time. I get that. But for the the purposes of this example, um, let's just assume that you're a perfect parent 100% of the time. So... If you're a perfect parent, wouldn't you expect that your child, wouldn't you expect the child of a perfect parent, a child that enjoys perfect security and perfect love from his parent or her parent, wouldn't you expect that kid to grow up to become a mature and a productive and a well-adjusted adult? Now, during that that, that growth process, that kid is not going to be perfect 100% of the time, Right? Why would they be? If they were already perfect, there'd be no room for growth. But while the kid's growth kind of kind of naturally varies and the maturity varies on a day-by-day basis, what doesn't ever vary is the is the secure the security of a and the loving relationship with you, the parent. You love them the same no matter whether they're throwing a temper tantrum in the aisle at the Walmart, or whether they're doing something kind to the little brother and sister or cleaning up around the house without having been asked. You love them the same either way. Your kids just know from experience that you love them no matter what, and that that love isn't dependent upon whether they're growing in maturity or whether they're doing something good. And as a result, that kid is, is free to grow and to flourish simply because that kid's assured of your love. Love that love that loves them when they're messing up, the same as it loves them when they're doing good. And over time, as this kid grows, your love for them just becomes part of who they are. It seeps into their DNA. Your love for them is their constant reminder that they belong to you. And it's not a hope so, it's not a a think so or a maybe so kind of love. 
It's an assured love that empowers your kid to to grow to become a mature and productive and a well-adjusted adult. Empowers that kid to become that one day that perfect parent to his or her own kids. And you know, the good news about all that is that we don't have to theorize. We don't have to, to come up with hypothetical examples to experience that kind of love. According to the text Lauren just read, we are the children of our perfect parent. We're the, we're the children of Abba, our father. So we can be assured with, with 100% confidence that we're secure and loved even when we're messing up, even when we're stalled out on the side of the road. And what that means is that, is that we're free to travel on this journey to perfection with the assurance that if we respond, if we participate in faith, we'll get there. Abba, our perfect parent, will just love us into it. We'll become his love. Well, all that's good. I don't know about you, but, but while, I may, while I may be assured and 100% confident in God's grace, when it comes to going on to perfection, I'm not so confident in my own response. I'm 100% confident that God's going to do his part of that equation. I'm just not so confident about my response. I trust God. I've just been around myself long enough to know that eh, I'm not that trustworthy at times. Am I the only one? Okay, good. So how can I be assured then that I'm responding to God's perfect grace in a way that, that leads to the perfection that I'm called to. How can I manage that part of that equation? The only part of the equation that I can manage. Well, how about this? It's kind of a, it's kind of a, a, a going on to perfection progress litmus test of sorts that, that I think is helpful for us to, to really look in the mirror and prayerfully be honest with ourselves and with our God as to how we're doing in terms of our faithful response to God's grace. And the whole thing, there's a couple things I want to point out, but it all is based upon this. This is kind of the foundation of this litmus test. Paul points us to, this, to the witness of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit joins our spirit. Our spirit doesn't join God's. God's spirit joins us. The first thing that we have to, to come to grips with, and it's foundational to this whole thing, is that God's Spirit always takes the initiative. So we have to realize that, and we have to make room for God's initiative in our lives. God's Spirit initiates our journey. We can only become perfect love by first allowing ourselves to be perfectly loved. So it always starts with God. Wesley would say that that, that we'll even grow holy in our heart and we'll even grow holy, holier in our life before we're even conscious that it's happening. God's Spirit will join ours and as we participate, we'll, we'll just find ourselves being more holy of heart and holy in the way we live before we're even conscious that it's happening. God will love us into becoming more like his perfect love. And you know, Wesley, he said that because he knew it from experience, and I'll tell you how he learned it. Wesley, he, uh, early in his ministry, he decided he wanted to be a missionary. So this was, this was at the, you know, in the 18th century. So he hops on a boat, and he goes to what's now Georgia. And he's going to be a, a missionary to the, to the indigenous people, the Indians there. He's going to introduce the heathens to Jesus. Well, he goes and he does that, and he's there three or four years, can't remember, three or four years. He's a miserable failure. He just failed. Basically got kicked off the continent, and they sent him back to England. So he hops on a slow boat back to England. He's depressed because he knows he failed. He got fired. So he's headed back on this slow boat back to England, and this guy he meets on the boat, Peter Bomber. 
is his name. Now, Peter was a German guy, and, and I think if in today's vernacular, he would be considered a Baptist. But he ends up being close friends with, with John Wesley and kind of becomes his, his spiritual director, his spiritual guide. And, and he needed it because he was depressed. And so they're traveling back, and they finally get back to England, and Wesley is still an Anglican priest. You know, he's still got a pastor job. And he's in his apartment or in his house talking to this, this Peter Bomber who's trying to counsel him through these hard times. And, and Wesley just admits, he says, I don't know how I can stand up in front of all these people and preach about God's love and grace because I'm not sure I've experienced God's love and grace myself. I don't even know that I've experienced it. And I love what Peter said to him. And re- he said, John, you just preach God's love. You just preach the faith until you experience the faith. Just let God take the lead. You just do, and God will take care of the rest. And it wasn't long after that that, that that's exactly what happened. And on, a, on a street in Aldersgate, he had this experience. And he finally felt himself, that which he'd been telling people about for years. So that's the basis. God has to take the lead. God's spirit joins ours. We don't join God. But then there's some other things that we can look at as we look in the mirror and really is a litmus test for ourselves and our response to God's grace. And the first one is is very pragmatically this. Can Can you say that you have consciously repented of your sins? If you're honest with yourself, can you say that you've consciously repented of your sins? You know, God's the one that makes our repentance possible. But we actually have to do it, right? We actually, it's a matter of our will. God opens the door. We got to walk through it. Just think about that, that the prodigal son sitting in the pig, pig sty, surrounded by pigs. And he kind of goes into this talking to himself speech. Well, I'll go back to my father. I'll ask for his forgiveness. Now, if he had just said that and never had done it, that's not repentance you got to actually get up and turn around and go toward God. Have you actually repented of your sins? That's something that we can ask ourselves as a way of gauging our own response to God's grace. And another thing is this. If you look in the rearview mirror of your life, you look back, can you see that your life has actually changed? Because of Christ, is your life different today than it was a year ago or it was, certainly it was before you, you asked Christ to enter your heart? Can you see a change? And as a result of that change, can you honestly say that you're conducting yourself differently as a result? Are your relationships different as a result of that change that's happened in your life? And that kind of goes to the next one. There's a new character that that begins to flourish, a character that kind of reflects the image of God's character. Kind of a Galatians 5, fruits of the Spirit sort of thing is, do you find that you can love more easily? Are you more at peace with the world around you, even though it's not that peaceful at times? Do you find joy in places that you hadn't found it before or hadn't found it previously? Just little small things, evidence of God working in his creation that you pick up on that you maybe didn't pick up on before. Do you have more self-control? These are ways that we can kind of gauge that response part of the equation that we're responsible for. And finally, this is, this is one. Do you feel or do you find joy in serving God? Do you find, or is it an obligation? Something you have to do or something you want to do? I can think way back, long before I got into ministry, although I was out of the Army and moved back to Kansas City, and I had a traveling job, and I was, you know, I was all over at different airports all week long, traveled about four days a week. And I remember there'd be times where I'd get home, you know, on late on a Thursday night or sometimes Friday, and Hadn't seen Brendan in a week, and she'd say, hey, don't forget, we got that thing at church tomorrow on Saturday. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I've been traveling all week long, and now i got to go do what? <laughs> That's not joy in serving the Lord, but it's true. I outgrew it. I'm more perfecter now. <laughs> but that's another way to check. And I want to close with this. I want to close with this because this, what I want to tell you, I think, puts all this into the right context, I hope. 
This is something that I learned way back when. I think it was in flight. Well, I know it was in flight school at this time. And I remember an instructor pilot. Didn't know he was preaching the gospel, but he was. I remember an instructor pilot once standing up. It was a classroom thing. We weren't flying, but he was standing up in his classroom lecture, and he, and he was talking about target fixation. A target fixation is something that, that you have to worry about when you're a pilot because whatever you stare at when you're flying got to be careful because whatever you're looking at, you're going to fly into, right? So if you're staring at those power lines that you're trying to avoid, guess what? You're going to fly into them if that's the only place you're looking. If you're staring at that tree you're trying not to hit or that mountain you're trying to avoid, stare at it long enough, you're going to fly into it. Well, I've kind of turned that on its head. You know, if Jesus is the, the author and perfecter of our faith, if he's the model of the perfect love perfection that we're pursuing, if we'll just keep our eyes focused on him, we just keep walking with him and following him, you know what? We're going to fly right into it. We're going to fly into his perfection. Because it's not our perfection we're going for. We're going for Christ's perfection. So if we just focus on him, we'll fly right into it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what is by human standards just unrealistic, crazy demands. You call us to to love our enemies. How can we have an enemy if we love them? You call us to be perfect. But every time we look in the mirror, all we see is imperfection. You call us to these crazy things, Lord, but then you somehow have a way of loving us into those, to becoming those things. Lord, you call us to love our enemies. We can't have an enemy if we love them, and I guess that's the point. So, Lord, thank you for leading us day by day Thank you for stopping when we're stalled on the side of the highway. Thank you for getting us back on track when we're distracted. Thank you for giving us the minds and the wills to all the wherewithal that we need to actually respond to your grace. Lord, help us to to give you our lives as a response of of your grace and have them have you turn them into your your son's perfection Lord thank you for calling us to absurd things and thank you for giving us the giving us what we need to to actually get there Lord we thank you for a church family a place in which we can we can come and and share your light and your love and we can come and and share out our our responses to your grace on kind of try them out on one another. We thank you for this opportunity and this family where we can love each other unconditionally the same way that you love us. Lord, when we leave this place, it's when the road gets hard. So we ask that you lead and guide us. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Gathered at the highest throne Welcomed by a melody An anthem I have always known song that's always been in me all glory and honor dominion and power to you a million angels fall face down on the floor all to echo
before the throne of grace majesty before my eyes let it take my breath seen several times and we kind of had to pivot in a few ways different ways this morning and and so we looked at this video together and it talked about the majesty and the wonder and the awesomeness and the bigness of our God and I was reminded all over again of of my smallness which and my smallness is not necessarily a, a bad thing when we're talking about God Because I was reminded that sometimes my wants and desires and my my prayer life looks a lot different than what it needs to look like. My prayer life looks a lot like giving God demands or, or giving God my opinion or asking God to follow what I uh, what I'd like to see happen. But this morning I was reminded of God's bigness, of God's glory, God's majesty. And inside of all of his bigness and all of the creation all of his creation and, and everything that he he is or, or everything that he ever uh, was or everything he's ever going to be for all of us and all of that and all of his big, bigness in Jackson, Missouri on October 24th in Jackson, Missouri he wants a relationship with me he is everything is every let's sing that together again you're my author come on because you're my author my maker my ransom my savior my refuge my hiding place you're my helper my healer my blessed redeemer my answer my savior
Amen. Thank you, man. So we got a new drummer today. Yeah. Hey. Pray for uh, pray for Josh. He showed up this morning and we were getting ready to hit the first note and he said, "Guys, I'm not going to make it." He had to go home and so I got on the phone and said, "Hayden, I don't know if you're dressed or not, but uh, put on a long t-shirt and get here." <laughs> so. Well, thank God you're here. It's good to have you. So, couple one big announcement, a couple probably. Uh, don't forget your your estimate of giving cards, a little piece of paper. Bring them in next week, or you know, you can take them by the office earlier if you want to. But, but I'm kind of hoping we'll we'll bring them in, um, and we'll take these little pieces of paper and let God do something sacred with them. Let God turn our little piece of paper with what little we have. We'll lay it there, and, and God will take care of the rest. That's the promise. So that don't forget that next week. The other thing is we got the men's retreat coming up. Tell me that date again. January 21, 23, gentlemen. So. If you haven't signed up already, uh, please get signed up. It's going to be a good time. We've got a great speaker. Um, it's not Mark and it's not me. So we got a great speaker. So, so you got that going for you. I think that's the only announcement, other announcements I have. So let me just say this. As we leave this place, as we leave this perfect place where we can love each other perfectly in this safe place, it doesn't do much good here. We've got to take it out there where things aren't so perfect. And we got to shine God's perfect light and love into that dark place out there. But God has perfectly equipped us to do that. We've been loved by God. Now it's time to go share that love with others. So go in peace to love and serve. Amen and amen.